Welcome to this episode of the podcast. I have a great honor of having a great HSC professional with me today. He's called Dan Crawford. He is going to introduce himself just shortly. He works in a very fascinating industry that is definitely seeing uh, a pressure in these times. So I'm very curious to know what's going on on his side. And actually, we are in kind of the opposite side of the world. So there's also uh, some fascination to that as well. So Dan, thank you so much for actually joining me on this episode. How are you today? I'm doing good, Dr. Jetson, and thank you so much for having me on today. It's a pleasure, and I must say that I'm quite humbled that you would call me a doctor, but I'm actually, I'm not. It's just so that that's clarified. I thought you I were Dr. Jetson. Well, I still consider you one, right? On, on this side of the world, <laughs> I'll, I'll consider you one, right? <laughs> that's very much appreciated. Um, we have a doctor working with us on our team, but as as I can't claim that, it is... <laughs> It's quite a big step, actually, if you want to call yourself a a doctor here in, at least in my part of the world, you have to do a very long and thorough education and then step into the university world, which I've already uh, obviously done my university degrees, but I have, I don't have, I can't claim that title. (laughs) So, but it's morning where you're at, right? Uh, Yes, sir. Nine o'clock a.m. in uh, Dallas, Texas. Nice. And can you elaborate a bit more on where you're working at the moment? Just kind of give us a bit of stats on your where you're working, what's, what's going on right now. Exactly. So I work for Neighbors Industries, uh, which we are in the uh, energy production industry, specifically primarily uh, in the oil and gas uh, production, right? And so uh, I, I started with them. I, I've been with uh, Neighbors now for about 18 months. And uh, I, I began primarily as an HSE specialist. And I, I want to do a quick shout out to you and your team uh, because uh, the mental focus specialist certification I was able to get, I think, um, your that's where you and I actually first encountered one another was taking that. And that was when I was a HSE specialist. And here in the last uh, five to six months, um, I became a part of the performance improvement team. Um, In the field, we're called the pit crew, performance improvement team crew. And so uh, we specifically go out, uh, visit our oil and gas drilling rigs, and we kind of do, not kind of, we do uh, an assessment. And we kind of look at the the climate around the rig, the environment, right, the actual rig, the culture, uh, what are the behaviors, and then the systems and the processes that are in place. Uh, so we kind of look at it from a very holistic point of view. And so it's it's kind of a new take uh, because we do have operations and safety uh, individuals on our team. But uh, we're seeing some very uh, good results coming out of that. So it's kind of a, uh, a new evolution, a new iteration, if you will, of, of looking at uh, you know, safety and performance in the energy production industry. Ah, that's very fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing. Can you, just for my clarification and the definition also in neighbors could be quite interesting to kind of dive into. So what what is the difference between being an HSC specialist and then being part of the performance improvement team? Very good. So um, HSC specialists are your traditional, um, you know, safety people, if you will. They are, are the ones that are going out and checking your rig compliance, doing inspections, checklists, doing case management, uh, also um, on location during rig moves, and basically anything that comes up from a safety perspective, um, they are the ones that will respond to those rigs. For instance, when I was an HSC specialist, um, I was assigned three to four drilling rigs, drilling rigs, my apologies. And so uh, our hitches run 14 days on, 14 days off. So I would visit multiple times during my 14 day hitch. I would go uh, visit the rig, evaluate it, support the rig, and basically uh, hopefully give them the tools uh, to be successful, but to also uh, evaluate um, are they compliant in all areas, you know, from the actual rig itself, the parts, the systems, are they operating well to our, our behaviors, um, 
you know, from a standpoint of are we operating safely, efficiently? Are we using our permits to work properly? Things of that nature. Hopefully that helps define that piece of it. And then on the performance improvement team, we actually go in and we're doing a much broader look. The HSE specialist, I would say, is at the 100 foot level of the uh, rig because we are out there actually hands on. And we do that, too, at, at the performance improvement team. But we're really we start at about the thousand foot level and we're looking at it from a more holistic point of view, much more about systems, processes. And then we delve over the course of three to five days down to that level to see where we can get um, our crew members, our team, our superintendents, rig managers to perform at a higher level. All right. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And just for my understanding, it's it's not the case that the HSC specialists are gone from the organization. They're still there, right? Exactly. We have those in uh, each of our different districts. In the Southern Division, we have your West Texas, East Texas, in South Texas, and there are some, there are HSE specialists, multiple ones on both sides of the 14 day hitch that are there in those locations. There is, uh, I was on the first performance improvement team that went out, and uh, now we have three that are operating currently uh, throughout the lower 48 that are going to do that. So, no, the pit crew performance improvement team is a sm much smaller group than those HSE specialists that are currently in the field working right now. All right. So we're going to touch upon backwards to that just shortly, but just for the listeners, because um, I can't help it. I always enjoy a good story. Right. And I know that your career hasn't always been in HSE. It's Correct. kind of a journey that you're on. Correct. So would you mind sharing a bit on that? Because I, I think it's, it's quite impressive. So uh, believe it or not, um, and I do have an EDD, which is your educational doctorate, right? And so I actually spent uh, the first 24 years of my professional career uh, in K-12 public education. I was a coach uh, and a teacher uh, for uh, right at uh, six years there. And then the last uh, 17 had been spent as uh, I was an elementary principal for five years and a high school principal for um, 12 years, right? And so you're probably wondering, how do you go from that to this, right? <laughs> and so um, I did, uh, I went through a spell in my life of, of doing something for quite a long time. And it was mm -hmm. time for a, a shift and a change. We, we all, I, I enjoyed my time as an educator. I really did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we did some good work. And I actually was a part of building three different schools. And all three of those schools or part of schools were built on the same site as the old school, right? So you can imagine the um, safety issues and uh -huh. the safety of students, faculty, staff, and parents that would come into play where you would have to take down something and then build something right next to it while the school year is going on and such. But uh, back to what I was saying before, I did have some struggles in my life. I uh, succumbed to some uh, issues from my past and, and, and I went through a time of struggle and I, it was time for me to get out of education, to, um, get back to something that I wanted to challenge me. And basically, uh, Bjorn, I'm just going to tell you, get back to being a good, uh, overall human man, global citizen, productive worker, um, father, husband, uh, brother, sister, son, or not sister, brother, uh, son. And so uh, I, I just, you know, about 18 months ago, went through a real transition in my life. And I found uh, this was always a passion of mine. And uh, I got on board with neighbors. And it's just been an incredible journey, you know, going through learning this piece. Because yes, there were pieces of this industry that I was not aware of on the operation side, right? And so I had to mm -hmm. learn those pieces. But when you talk about systems, processes, high performance level, high performance cultures, those, can, those transcend into other areas, right? Yep. So many yep. times we think about just an industry has to only have examples in that industry. And so, uh, you know, I believe that I've found success by being able to take some of my prior life experiences of learning and growth and kind of 
provide that as well for what our current state is for uh, safety operations and most importantly our pit crew i understand part of all the choices that could have been done in the world right all the career paths that you could have <laughs> been to, right how on earth did you open up the newspaper and then it was just spelled out hsc there right so um you're you're exactly right when people heard that i was going into oil and gas uh, and that i was making this transition it was this is the last thing i would th think that that you would be doing dan right um but actually i had uh, a a couple of friends um adam and amanda very good friends of mine uh, in tyler texas and they knew that i went through a time of struggle and I, i'll just be frank with you i resigned from my position i had uh, lost a lot uh, in my life and i was just at a point where i needed a complete change with everything and um adam gave me a shot at neighbors industries and said here's a shot you can start at the bottom and you can work your way up make it make it what you will right and so um started at, at the bottom and I had to work my way up and what a journey it's been i cannot tell you how good uh, neighbors industries um all the way from you know the uh, yard in tyler texas all the way up to corporate in houston how good they've been to me and allowed me uh, to go on this uh, journey of growth and learning. And and I want to say this to Bjorn, there, there's so many people that think, well, you went from this industry to that industry. Well, I didn't get a, a educational doctorate just to be called Dr. Crawford, right? Or Dr. C, that's what I used to be called. It was about the learning journey, right? And mm -hmm. so here I was at 46, completely starting over in a new journey where I was literally the guy that knew the least of anyone. I want to tell you, I, I don't remember the last time I grew in a 12 month period like I had the last 12 months. And I'm being totally sincere and honest with that because it's something new and different that I haven't understood or known about, but I was able to take some of my knowledge of systems and processes of cultural development, right? Uh, of mentoring, of coaching and combine that with this new industry. And it's just come together like a puzzle that's, you know, I, I hope has been beneficial for neighbors, but also has in, in, been incredibly beneficial for me per, from my perspective. All right. So, um, first of all, thank you for for sharing. It is much appreciated, and and it is part of kind of why I'm fascinated about doing these podcasts because we can actually listen to stories of people. I really want to give a huge shout out to neighbors as a whole because giving people an opportunity to actually dive in and do something from the bottom up and actually people who doesn't necessarily have this, this straight on qualification of what it is that we're looking for and what kind of capabilities do we absolutely need to have in this role to succeed, but more looking upon what kind of human do we have in front of us do we believe that there are some capabilities here that we can actually develop on? And every time that we see that, uh, I've done a lot of recruitment in my past. So every time that we see that, it just means that people are growing exponentially with the, with the responsibility that they're getting, which has also been kind of shown in, in quite clearly in your case, because you're doing a really, really spectacular job uh, in your everyday life. But there is also... I quite, there is something where you actually leave some of the responsibility at the doorstep. Whenever you allow yourself to say, I, I, I have no prior experience in this. I want to learn as much as humanly possible. Please teach me. And then just having kind of the, <clears throat> having the self-confident and actually standing out and saying, Hey, I, I don't know about this. Can you please explain to me? And then when they explain, just be honest and say, you know what? I'm not sure I understood it the first time, but uh, can you elaborate a bit on this? Or what should I prioritize in learning so that we can have a fruitful conversation in the future? And I think that that's, that's quite interesting. So you obviously, the vast, and the beauty of HSC people, right? is that the vast majority all, all say, oh, so I've been in the game for 25 years or 30 years or something like that. And in your case, it's a little bit different because your experience right. is relatively short, right? Yes. 
So I think it's interesting because what would you say that were the biggest crossover coming from an educational world and then stepping into HSC? Because I think that there are quite a big step over, but I would love to hear your reflection on that. So just so I can clarify, you want to know the, the, the biggest crossover? So where, where would, when you step into HSE, you're yeah. curious, you're educating yourself, right? But at some point you must have met the reflection. I know this, I know exactly how to do this. And maybe you even had the reflection. I can do this better than you guys are doing it right now. Okay. So b very good point. And I wouldn't, I would never say doing it better than, um, someone else, but I do think I, I could play to my strengths, if you will, right? So yep. along with being a high school principal and elementary principal for 17 years, I was a college professor, adjunct college professor as well. It, yeah, it wasn't enough that I ran a, a school with 2,500 kids and 275 staff members and built a $110 million <laughs> facility the last uh, five years of my education career. I also was a, a professor at UT Tyler in Dallas Baptist University. And what I enjoyed about that was the connection with people. And w when you, you talk about that, I, you asked me to, to share a little bit about the shifts that I see in HSE, right? And, and what these roles are. And I think this is one of those areas that there is a, a, a cultural shift that is taking place, okay? And what do I mean by that? I think that the HSE role, as we move forward, is much more of a mentoring, coaching, training, and, and working with our um, team members to help them grow, understand, and learn, right? I'm an educator by trade for 24 years. And so, um, and I think you would agree with me here, Bjorn, that if all you measure is compliance, what is the best you're going to get? Compliance right? And so I truly believe that as we, you know, travel through time, our eight, you will see the HSC role grow more from a compliance, going to visit, uh, you know, whether it's a rig or warehouse or whatever, and just, you know, checking off things as being there to being more of a reactive culture to proactive culture, right? From compliance to performance. In other words, we're not just checking for compliance here. How can we get our performance to be higher while, you, while making sure that we are compliant? This is my example, if, if you will allow. Please. Are you familiar at all? I'm a big uh, racing fan, right? Uh, and I'll be honest with you, Max Verstappen. I love Lisa <laughs> Max, right? Team Red Bull. My buddy, my buddy Keith and I uh, over at Exxon, we, we follow – him greatly and, and love to watch his journey, right? And his uh, second championship in a row. But whether it's NASCAR, Formula One, open wheel, I, I'm sure you're familiar with a pit stop, right? Okay, they come in and they've got to change tires, gas. They've got to take, uh, the, you know, um, a windshield cover off in NASCAR, whatever it may be. I wonder, Bjorn, do you think that the pit crew chief has to say, okay, guys, Let's make sure we put our gloves on. Okay, team, good job. We're all going to put our visors down. Okay, good. Are you all checking your air guns to make sure that you're ready? Um, guy that's going to, you know, the, uh, the gas can man, make sure you have your sheet, heat shield on. Do you think that has to take place? No. That is a standard that is there. And then they work up to performance. Okay? Their compliance of safety, make sure how they operate, make sure they, they do the, the different pieces to be prepared to safely operate. Those are a given, right? The compliance is a standard. They're not worried on performance, how quickly they can do the task and job. How often, whether it's the energy production industry or in other industries, do HSE supervisors, managers have to remind people, wear your PPE, why are you not wearing your gloves? Why did you touch this piece of equipment? Why did you bend down with your, you know, your back, not your legs, right? We're still having that conversation and it's hard to talk about performance when you can't even get to that standard, right? And so that's why our 
pit crew is about performance improvement because we want those standards to be just a given in place. We know that's what's going to happen every single day. And a high performance culture, that's what they do. They're not talking uh, about on a repeated basis those smaller compliance pieces. They've got through that and they're focused up here. Now, what is our challenge on that? Well, as you can imagine, in the energy production industry out in the field, um, we have a lot of uh, Gen Zers, right, that are being hired on. Uh, what is that, uh, you know, young men that are up to the age of 25, right, somewhere in there. And so you have a lot of, of them that we're hiring on as they, they come out. Some millennials, too, but Gen Zers. Well, as research tells us, well, from 18 to early 30s, each of those will have approximately 10 different jobs over that span. So every two to two and a half years, they're changing. So the same goes for our industry. So we've got to make sure, along with the, the, this culture changing, this drive for a performance, the last piece is we've got to know our people. We've got to know where they're coming from, their needs, how we need to uh, train them, get them prepared to be the best that they can possibly be because we are getting uh, an influx of people coming in and out, right? We're no different than, than other industries. Yeah. So we've got to make sure that we are educating them and preparing them um, so that they can be not only have optimal physical performance, but optimal mental performance as well. Okay. You're saying so many great things. Like, I don't know where to pick up and let go. Because, <laughs> okay. But I want to say this, right? Because we share a passion and I want to share a really funny story with you about, because that's part of kind of the uh, executive neuroscience safety facilitator program where I talk about, uh, and I use the pit stop as an example. Right. Because exactly. if you take the involvement of pit stop and you take that chart And then you find a chart of the involvement of safety. And then they are almost identical. So if you look upon how they, it evolved, right? So from the 80s until 2000, there is a straight line in falls of accidents, incidents, and service quality issue. Equal is there a huge fall in the time spent on doing a pit stop. And then we get to 2000. And then it's just a plateau. There is no change, right? Right. Especially in safety. If you look across the board and look at the data, everyone has experienced more or less the same amount of accidents, incidents, and service quality issues, which is quite funny. But if you look upon the data from the pit stop crews, there is still from 2010 to 2020, a 50, and I repeat, a 50% improvement in the time to do a pit stop. Right. And I love this analogy because this is something that can be explained. It's very visual to see that when you see the slow pit stop that they did in the 1980s, which is highly unsafe, they're not prepared. They're, Having a smoke they, break. It, exactly. <laughs> it's horrible. And then you look upon to date. And I think that that is part of, that's really part of the reflection that being right doesn't have to mean that you're slow. Using the neuroscience, using the mental capacity of people doesn't mean that you're slowing down production. It actually means the opposite. That now that every, as you mentioned, there's no one questioning how they should put on the gear, how they should be prepared, but they also, and this is where it becomes fascinating because they, they practice, they practice this, they actually take themselves out of the context And then they do the exercises over and over again. And I think that that's quite interesting. So that was my first bit to comment on this right. great story that you just shared, right? Because then we move to the next bit because this is where we bring it into our everyday lives. Because you mentioned that in the industry that you're in right now, historically seen and probably also in the future, there's going to be a lot of people coming on to do the job. Some will stick, some will leave and do other stuff. What is your, if you could elaborate a bit on that, what do you believe that's going to be the core elements? Because right now there are standards across the energy, across the oil and gas industry that they come in, they follow a certain standard, but at some point we need to do even better. What do you believe that's the thing that's going to increase the volume of success 
while, when we bring on new people into, into the energy production side. Okay, so I'm going to approach this from three different angles, okay? I'll be a little bit shorter on this, all right? And, and if you, want, you, you jump in and interrupt me if I need to, okay? All right? And this is the educator. I mean, it starts talking, right? The presenter in me. Um, Take your time. You know, you know the, the first thing that I would think about is so many people think that um, people generally leave for money or for more money. And what we have found as, as we have looked at um, our exit interviews in our industries and evaluated others, and, and there's even studies on this, the, the people that leave for money end up usually coming back over time, right? They'll go for money for this time and then they'll come back and there's some shift and ebbs and flows. But people, when you lose people and they don't come back, it's for two real reasons, right? Number one, they don't feel valued in their work. Like they're not respected and, and, and they, what they do and offer is not valued. And number two, they're not a part of a team. They're not a part of this greater than themselves group that's trying to achieve something, right? And I think that's so very important. And that's part of what we do as the, the pit crew is when we go in and we look at our individual rigs and their the culture and their behaviors, we want there to be buy into this team. We, we've got to meet this, the generation that we have now where they are to, to meet their needs, to, to, to train them, to make sure they understand about hydration, about sleep patterns, about a good diet, right? We've got to do those things, but we also want them to feel like they're a part of something bigger. Uh, you're probably aware of the JFK story, um, the janitor story from the JFK, when, when John F. Kennedy said, we're going to land a man in the moon by the end of the 60s, right? And in the, in the, in the early 60s, um, he, he had made this prediction. Well, and this, I'll, I'll make it a brief story, but it's an incredible story about buy-in, right? And it's in the, in the early 60s, he's traveling a, a NASA uh, facility, right? After we had made this commitment to land on the moon by the end of the 60s, and he's walking down the hallway, and there's a janitor there that, that's working. Obviously, he, he knew, you know, what his role was, but he asked him, you know, what, what is it you do here? We would think that he would respond, I'm, I'm a janitor, I'm a custodian, I, I clean, I do this and that. He said, sir, I'm doing my part to land a man on the moon, right? That's buy-in. That is a, he felt a valued member of the team, right? And, and that he was a part of something special. They, they valued his work and he was a part of something special all the way down to that custodial level, right? So I, I would say that's the first thing that, that we want to make sure um, that, that we're doing that for our employees. And how do you do that on an everyday basis? Very good. So how do we do that? That kind of goes to my second point. We want to make sure that we show them that they are valued. Uh, we're going to look at uh, everything from their crew houses to what is their level of development. We, we want to show them that we are investing in them, right? We want them to know we want you here and to be a part of what we do. So there are some things that are out of our control, right? But the things that are, whether it's uh, providing a weekly meal to them, whether it's a weekly recognition program, a hat, a t-shirt, here or there, a picture, thumbs up, attaboys, making sure they've got good mattresses in their crew houses and that uh, they have good uh, living quarters, that we're providing areas where they can grow and develop themselves through our training program. Uh, that is so very important that we are showing them. If, if you go into the energy production industry and you start on a rig and you're a floor hand and you don't have this vision, this vision of the future, that you see that I can do something else, that I'm a part of something bigger, it, it probably would get old to go in and out of 14 days on, 14 days off being a floor hand. But when they can buy into the vision of, I can have a future here, I can grow, I can develop, that I'm not just a floor hand working the power washer, I'm a floor hand on rig so-and-so, and I'm doing my part to make neighbors industries the driller of choice in the lower 48, right? totally different mindset and so there has to be intentional focus coaching mentoring and training on that and so and that's why where our superintendents and rig managers really come into play that they are having a tremendous impact on our people 
It's truly fascinating. I think that there is a lot of organization that could really learn from that. And I really have to hold back on giving more examples <laughs> on why you're doing a great job. But what could be very interesting, because you have obviously given this some great reflections as well, but this is where you're at right now. Right. Where would you like to be? Where would it be great to be? Where do you dream that you are in 12, 6, 24 months? Okay. So you remember you asked earlier, do you still have HSC specialists? And I said, yes, we still have a lot of HSC specialists, right? That are, are, are there in our districts and they're working and doing that. Um, and again, I want to share this. You're asking me personally, not the, I'm not speaking for neighbors industries or any of that. This is where I would, I hope it will go in the direction in general. I don't want to ever uh, speak for the company Right, in regards to that, right? I just want to make that clear. So um, what I would like to see happen, and I do think there is some steps towards that in our industry as a whole, and even at Neighbors, I do believe we're going that way. Because six months ago, Bjorn, there was no performance improvement team or pit crew. There was none. It was all HSE specialists out in these areas. Then about five months ago, they rolled out one team, and I was on that initial team. And then... Four months ago, a second team, three months ago, a third team. I, I would love to see, the, like I'm talking about, that we grow this coaching, uh, mentoring, training, a proactive approach, not reactive. And let's not be about compliance. Let's be about performance. And that we, I, you're still going to always need in any field. I'm not just talking about oil and gas energy production. You're still going to need HSE specialists, right? For, for case management uh, in our industry, for rig moves, uh, for uh, if, you're, if you're moving from one district, South Texas to West Texas, those things will be there. But I, I would love to see, and I think it's a game changer. I truly think it's a game changer to have a, a, a group of HSC. Yes, the reactive piece and the compliance piece, but I also think down the road, it would be great to see the growth of um, proactive people looking at performance that are going in and we have a weekly safety meeting. I mean, we have a uh, pre-tour safety meeting every single day for 30 minutes uh, in the morning and night before the, the, the crews go out. And then we have a weekly safety meeting every Saturday, right? And so there's opportunities there every single day. Yes, we have to talk about operations. We always should. We should talk about, you know, our, our safety observation cards, um, you know, how, what is our operations and our task for tonight or the day, make sure we're safe. But there's, there's a lot of avenues there that we can really provide some coaching and some mentoring um, with these individuals and really help them grow, right? And to, and to help them, uh, not only, we want them to be safer, obviously. Yeah, a, a connection on a rig floor, uh, making, you know, a, a, a drilling stand connection and having three individuals out there with the driller running uh, the connection, and, you know, and the drill string and, and where they all move, their hand placement, where they stand, things of that nature. It's just like a, you know, a, a pit stop, right? It's up on a drilling floor. Mm -hmm. So we want them to be and to have the tools that they can use to be as, as highly efficient and effective as they can in the safest manner possible. And I, that's where I would like to see uh, in the in the year or years to come that we see more individuals in the industry because i think there is there are some individuals in hse that w would be incredible uh, mentors coaches and trainers right not that they're not doing a great job now but but they have some skills and talents that i don't even think are tapped into totally yet right and i know that i'm a bit of a nerd right but in the coaching and the mentoring can you be more specific what is it that you actually see that's not there right now that you would like there to be in the future Okay, so what gets assessed gets better. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Right. So we have our, and I'm going to speak in general terms here, but, you know, everybody kind of has their roadmap to success, right? Uh, any organizations we have at Neighbors Industries, our journey to excellence. And we have within that our uh, rules to live by, which Shell, Chevron, XTO, uh, Exxon, they all have similar ones, but we've got those, for instance, for us. We've got our guiding uh, principles, behaviors of operational excellence, our core value, what's right here for us, right? And so 
my belief is this. You give me something to memorize, I'm going to take it, look at it, memorize it, and we may even have posters up in the safety trailer, and I'm going to be able to say it to you, right? But making it come alive through conversation and through discussion, that is where the impact is made. Okay. For instance, um, uh, a, a JSA, right? Or a per- let's take a permit to work. You have a permit to work that you fill out, have to have a signature, say where you're going to work, things of that nature. I would ask you, is the key factor or element that's going to be success found in the signature? Or is it in the conversation with everybody that's on that permit that's going to take part in the job and to make sure it's done safely, efficiently, and effectively, right? I would make the argument mm-hmm. the compliance piece is the signature. And the success performance piece is in the conversation. So that's what I'm talking about. When you embed, I love the word embedding, right? When you can embed our our core values, guiding principles, journey to excellence into the daily tasks and operations, right? That's where the value is added, right? So, and and I want to make it clear. When, when I go to a rig as a pit crew member or as an HSC specialist, I'm looking at it through this lens here, okay? That's different than this lens, which is the um, team members, the driller, the rig manager. Their job is to drill a hole in the ground, right? Their job is to drill a hole in the ground, do it as, as efficiently, effectively, and safely as they possibly can. And I come at this different lens looking at it going, how can we improve? How can we get better? Yes, some of it's the rig environment the climate, some of it's the culture and the behaviors. And so the more that we're able to interact, because there's that they should be worried about those people, that crew of six or seven should be worried about drilling that hole and doing their jobs in that way. We should provide support and assistance to help this culture, high performance yep. culture to grow. Does that yep. make sense? Uh, completely. And okay. maybe you could even elaborate a bit more on it. So if you go back to the pit crews, right? Wh- why do you think that some of the pit crews are a second or two faster? What kind of specific training is it that you think that they have that the other crews doesn't have? Where where do you see the distinguished there? Okay. Um, I think in every single industry, personnel is number one putting mm-hmm. the right people in the right place at the right time. Okay. Um, the, the, the pit crews that are performing at the highest level, they have got the best people with the most experience that understand what to do and are high performance individuals themselves. Okay. I think it always goes back to that individual kind of like you can have the best presentation in the world and It can be an amazing PowerPoint video, Bob, Bob, Wells, whistles. But if you can't present it, it's a flop, right? Same thing here. It goes back to the individual. You may know what to do, but if you're not a high performer, you can't. So personnel is number one. Number two, it takes practice that is evaluated and followed up on. If they just say, go out and y'all practice and they time it and say, okay, that's good. We did five runs today. That's okay. That's pretty good. Let's try to get better tomorrow. How is that really assessing for improvement, right? So if we have, and how do you bring them to the high performance? How do you bring them to the high performance? So you have to point out the details and the specifics of where they can improve. Okay. My third piece I was going to tell you is the innovative piece. People will improve and perform better when you put the onus on them and challenge them. How can you improve by 15 seconds in what you just did? I want y'all to be involved in this problem solving. How can we do that? Give me some ideas. Rather than one person pointing it top down, it needs to go field driven up. The pit crew is part of the field up. What we see needs to have happen and we're reporting up, right? We want to involve each of them in why is your why are you slower why are we not performing well and how can we improve key point did you know that in the navy we in the united states navy that we use stainless steel uh nuts and bolts on our ships yeah okay do you know where that came from no oh sorry i said yes i meant no no okay sorry no so you know where that came from and this is why i want to 
I want to hone in on this point is directly relative. Years ago, every year when they're in port or, or when they would come in uh, to dock, they would go through and, and the, the lowest level sailors and even other sailors would go and they would scrub all the nuts and bolts and the paint and the rust was coming through and all of this, right, was happening. And, and so they would come, they would scrub these things down, clean them up real good, and then paint them again. Long story short, when there was a, a change in the admirals, one going out, one going in, the new admiral realized he needed to listen to the people a little bit more. There was a disconnect there from the old admiral. One day he's on the deck and you had this lowest level sailor cleaning and, and you know, uh, cleaning the bolts. And he says, Admiral, so you mind if I ask a, a question? Can, can, I, can I ask you something? He's like, yeah, go ahead, shoot. Have you ever thought about using stainless steel nuts and bolts on these ships to where we didn't have to do this? every single year what no i guess i didn't think about it that ship ends up going to stainless steel the rest of the fleet eventually and now that's pretty much the standard all from a lowest level employee that had buy-in and was asked and to help problem solve so we've got to listen to all of our people to find out ways you know you talked about how i have not completely you go and i completely agree with you but still the the people that you're mentoring and coaching yes. and the people in the pit crew. So in your belief and what you're describing right now is that if we listen to them, they will improve by 50%. So you, you mean you still believe that it's the mechanic of how they're doing it that will change and bring the biggest significant impact to their everyday job? I wouldn't say only the mechanics. I think it's our behaviors in how we are acting, how we approach our jobs, our daily tasks, and our operations. Because if we cut down on incidents and we operate in a safer manner, that's going to be less downtime in our industry, which is going to raise up performance. I also believe when people have a realize that they have valued input into operations and what's going on, they may not on, on major tasks or operations, but they at least find growth and they have buy-in and they want to do that. So I think there is the, the, the mechanics piece, there's the behaviors piece. And then, you know, lastly, we've got to make sure that all the way from our supply chain to our maintenance upkeep, to our equipment upkeep, that it's all performing at a high level, right? We, we've got to make sure that we're keeping that rig in a good operational stance. From the pit crew analogy, if they just checked on every Sunday morning if the jack was greased and ready to go and didn't have any problems and wasn't missing a wheel, that probably wouldn't be good, right? So they have to check that on a regular basis. So I think that's that's uh, that's part of it as well. I completely agree with you. All right, Dan, it has been a true pleasure to have you on this episode of the the podcast. Is there anything that you is there anything that you think that I missed to ask you? I I really don't. I just I I appreciate you very much having me on, and uh, I would say that over time it is people do not put uh, enough emphasis on the value and importance of of having a conversation or discussion in moving things forward. Um, I believe that every conversation like this I have, I walk away with something tangible that go that makes me think, and I go, oh, I need to think about that in the future. And I think if we look at things that way, that um, we will continue to improve both personally as individuals, but overall in our industry as well. So, so thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come on today. You're more than welcome. It was a great pleasure to have you here. And once again, thank you so much. You bet. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.